<laughs> Welcome to Exploring Real World Conflicts in Otherworldly Settings, the intersection of storytelling and morality in science fiction. If you think you're here to talk about getting an agent, you're in the wrong place. That's across the hall in a half hour. <laughs> We're talking sci-fi and fantasy, and we actually um, did this panel at Rhode Island Comic Con, some group of us, and we, we um, had a really neat discussion about this. I had the idea to, to change up our, our panel uh, when we were at um, Big Apple Con last year. And I was hanging out with Cass Anvar from The Expanse. Really, I literally was hanging out. It was awesome. It was a good fangirl day. And we were talking about how um, the messages and the, um, the storytelling that happens in science fiction and fantasy often really is taking a, a, a question out of the real world and exploring it to its either logical or illogical end. You know, you can really take something and, and, and go in a completely different direction with it and explore. And so I thought that would be a, that would be a fun conversation to have and a fun panel. So I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves first, and then I will pitch them a couple of questions, and then I will open it up for the audience to ask questions. And you're welcome to ask us about anything to do with writing process, science fiction, fantasy, the topic at hand. Um, but I do ask that you keep it to a question, and one question per person, unless I can come back around for you, okay? So, let's start in this direction, and I will let you all introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Squadrino. I'm the author of the Overlord's Fantasy Book Series, and I'm also the Vice President of uh, ARIA, and the Committee Chairman that put this on. So hopefully everybody's having a good time. And, uh, I've been busy. Um, of course, I did forget to bring my books to bring them up here, but I'm in the uh, I know, like, uh, I'm in the uh, in the uh, audience over there, so I have a table to come by and see me. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm Dr. Perry. Um, the D stands for Diana. Uh, not anything else. So don't get any ideas. I don't write romance or steamy anything. Um, I try to make people laugh. So, uh, which I mean, you know. Okay. Um, but I do write uh, paranormal and urban fantasy, and I do write some sci fantasy, and I write alternate history. Um, so I explore quite a bit uh, with my with my work. I'm Angelina Singer. I'm the author of the Upper World series, which is a sci-fi dystopian trilogy that I have here. I have a table right up front of the door here, so definitely come by and see me. I also have a romantic sort of story with a sci-fi twist. So I have a couple different genres I play with. Um, I really enjoy the adult genre as a whole, but adults enjoy them too, so it's not limited in that way. And I'm Tabitha Lord. I'm the author of the Horizon series. Book one and two are out and for sale at Table 318. That I didn't bring. You think this was our first reading? Like, no books. I can show up like a. We've only done this dozens of times. I mean, you guys can borrow some of mine and write them. <laughs> um, and book three in my series will be out May 7th. And uh, we write some short fiction. I'm the managing editor for a um, British blog for the Inkit. Um, publishing house, and I do some other editorial work. So that's me, and this is how I described our panel. The writers don't work in a vacuum. Fiction, especially science fiction, offers opportunity to explore real, real world conflicts and moral dilemmas from the safety and distance of another time or place. Are writers obligated to address the pressing issues of our time in our work? How does the news cycle impact our storytelling? What interesting questions are science fiction writers exploring today, either in writing or on the screen? Join us for a thought-making conversation. So I'm actually going to start with that first piece, um, and I'm going to answer myself first. Are we obligated to deal with things in our writing? Are, you know, there's a lot going on in the world, and we feel the sense of um, obligation to our readers to take a stand, to explore a question, to, to talk about something moral in our work. And I will say, unequivocally, no we don't. We're entertainers first, um, and, and my job is to tell you a good story. However, you almost can't help it, and so I'm always dealing with something through my writing, but my first obligation as a writer, I believe, is to tell you a good story. And often, the fodder that you get from the outer world feeds into that, so I do use it, but I don't feel an obligation to take the stand about an issue in my work. But I'll let these guys, if they have anything to say about that. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with uh, Tabitha. I, I like, you know, I read a fantasy uh, series, so obviously, I have a world that's a little bit different than where we live in, and I like to be able to 
allow my readers to go to my world, to get away from the everyday stuff that happens in our world because it'll be very stressful and things like that. So if you can escape to a new realm where there's dragons and treasures and magic and warriors, it's a little bit more fun than some of the headlines that we see um, today. So I don't believe that I have an obligation to write um, about things that may be happening now. I, I believe, like, like Tabitha said, that I'm trying to entertain you and take you someplace uh, different. Um, I told you guys I'm not a doctor, um, and I'm not, but I kind of believe in do no harm. When, when I write, I try to do my best when I feel like this is my obligation. And it, the obligation isn't to make a social commentary or some sort of political statement with my work. But I do feel obligated when I represent someone who isn't like me in my work to do my due, due, due diligence and present them in an accurate and fair manner. So, I'm not Italian Catholic person, but my main character here is, and I talk to people who are so that I can represent his issues balancing vampirism and Catholicism because otherwise I would be kind of clueless about that and a person who's Catholic will read the book and it will just ruin their suspension of disbelief. They'll be like, wait a minute, why is he in there and the priest is a woman? You know, I mean, no, I wouldn't really quite, I'm not that kind of guy, okay, I promise. <laughs> um, but it's, it's important to do your due diligence and research when you are trying to represent somebody who isn't like you or anyone you know. So I think that's and, and Valentino agrees with me. What? <laughs> I absolutely agree with all that everyone has been saying so far. And I'm actually taking a sci-fi class right now uh, at school, and we're talking about how sci-fi can actually act as a sort of vehicle to show how the world exists currently or how it could be in an exaggerated state if things continue status quo. That could be positive or negative. But in a lot of dy dystopian novels, which I absolutely love, you see like Hunger Games diverge on how really intensely political systems can sort of coagulate into a larger problem. And I, I'm a firm believer that those sorts of things can be shown in sci-fi in a really user-friendly format that could show how these issues could become worse or could become better um, either way. So I actually read that in a really cool article um, that I used as research recently. I really agree with that uh, article's idea, so I thought it would be great to share it here. So in my conversation with Cass at Big Apple Conjure, this whole thing came about because I like, keep saying that's in a lot of them. Um, we talked about the old school Star Trek shows and how one of them, um, I was saying, I remember one where Kirk um, and the crew land on a planet and they're at war. This planet is at war, but it's a virtual war. And they're lobbing missiles at one another and blowing things up virtually, like it's a video game, but the people report to the disintegrator, the, the incinerator, and they die. They walk in and they die. And Kirk is like, no, 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 war is supposed to be terrible and messy so that we don't want to do it. And so he messes everything up and they go to war for real and then it ends and there's a real piece. And I thought, what an interesting concept. You know, that's a that's a that's high concept sci-fi right there in Star in old school Star Trek with the goofy aliens and the fuzzy you know, triples. But and that was one of them. And the other one they did was they had these two um, um, races, but they, they looked the same to us. One side was black, the other side was white. They were their skin tone was literally split down the middle, but the other people were black on this side and white on this side, and they were always at war too. And you, you know, from our perspective, you say, that's just ridiculous. But then you look at our world and you say, yeah, really? Ridiculous? Not so much. So I've been thinking about all of those issues. Um, you know, what are we seeing in modern television and storytelling that really is this powerful um, statement or something to explore deeply? And the one that I came up with, and I'm going to ask these guys what, what, what they've been thinking about that, but is Altered Carbon, and I said this at, at Rhode Island Comic Con, has anybody been watching Altered Carbon? And they basically took mortality off the table, that was their question that they were dealing with. What if mortality is off the table, and people can live lifetime after lifetime and download themselves into this ship? What happens to humanity? It was a great question. And so I'm going to ask these guys, either in your own work or what's out there that you're reading or watching, what interesting questions are you coming up with? that's sort of feeding your imagination. Let's start on that side. 
All right, well, um, just to branch off a little bit, I don't know if you guys have heard of Wayward Pines at all. Yes, um, I think that plays really well into that question with the idea of how would life be in a different time and what if we didn't give consent to be sort of transported that way um, with these very disgusting creatures in this really structured little town that's all that exists left in the community. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but I would say that um, a big part of sci-fi is the unknown and the gothic and the uncanny. So if you can take something familiar like a cute little town and make it this suddenly scary, sort of decrepit place where you're trapped, I think it brings upon a really interesting look at humanity and how humanity reacts to being kind of trapped in the familiar, so to speak. So, um, it's out to just about that. Also, in regards to war, I don't know if you guys know Ender's Game. The, it's brilliant, I love yeah, it. I was going to use that as my next example. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when you take war and you make it almost a play thing, like a video game, and it, um, in the book, the kids don't know they're actually fighting the war. Sorry if that's a major spoiler, but... Um, yeah, so if you can take the fear and the fighting out of the war itself, does it become easier to fight or harder? And is that supposed to happen? Is what I thought about that book. So these are questions I think about with that stuff. Um, I'm always asking what if, and um, it's why I end up writing something. Uh, and one of the things that happened was uh, I decided to binge watch, alternate binge watch, The Sopranos and Angel. Let me tell you, my nightmares were atrocious, especially if I stayed up late while I was watching and ate too much pizza, and uh, I drove my husband nuts. But that's where Changing Crime came from. Uh, the idea that you can have a mafia code, like in The Sopranos, and they struggle so hard in that show just to, to see what it should be and what their code should look like when things change, and I thought, oh my god, what if the thing that changed in the mafia wasn't new technology or Gen Xers and Millennials starting to take over? What if instead it was like angel, like vampires, like people using magic all over the place? And that's where this came from. Um, I started writing it and I realized that the, wait, that codes are never universal that honor codes especially, and, and anyone's sense of what is and isn't honorable, and what is and isn't acceptable. Um, you know, how much wiggle room do you have in each code? It varies so much. So I played with it heavily in this series. Um, and I feel like that is something that intrigues me. What is the right thing to do? Sometimes for two different groups, it's the opposite thing. So. A lot of people will sit here and try to tell you, well, we're all the same, and look at our similarities, and I love doing that. But it breaks down, so I explore why does it break down, because I do love the idea that we should be able to find common ground. But in practice, it doesn't always work like it, it does in theory. So exploring that in my, in my work and kind of, kind of getting intrigued by those ideas and putting them in my work and, and helps me figure out my own code which is probably the opposite of some of these in this room. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, it's really, it's it's intriguing the way that, you know, you might think about something and then um, have another person, they come up and they take it a completely different way. And I think that when we're writing science fiction and fantasy, um, we can explore those themes of how different people view things, the same thing, totally differently. Yeah, I'm going to touch on the... Uh the mortality part. Um, like I always say in my stories, I'm, I write fantasy, and dead is dead. And you know, the, the immortal stuff, I, it, it, it kind of, it, if you can keep coming back, then dying gets cheapened by that. So, in mine, dead is dead. And if you go out and do something foolish and get yourself killed, then there's a price to pay. And um, with all the wars and the, and the monsters and the dragons and the treasures and the peril that everybody gets put in, you have to have something that if something goes horribly wrong, you're done. You're not coming back. If you're immortal, then, well, I'll try jumping off the building. Oh, well, it didn't work, but I'm still alive and somebody will fix me up. So I, I kind of make sure that it's very important that you realize what you're doing as one of the characters in the story. And if you do something foolish and you die, well, that's going to impact the 
Officer Rudd died, and your quest, and the people you've been involved with, and the history of the land, and what may happen in the future. So, I think it's very important that Dan is there. I, I, I often steal your line. Yes, you do. Yes, like, you Dan do. is dead, and Mike's like, crap, I was going to talk about that. <laughs> All right, so I want to go back to Diana's what if question, because I think that's really interesting. In our writing, I always start something with a what if. Like that's that's my be that's my starting point. I did a short story, and the what if question was actually assigned to me. It's like, what if it's the last 24 hours of human existence? Boom! There's your assignment. Here's your paycheck. Go. And so that was super fun. But you know, when I'm when I'm creating my own thing, um, when I started Horizon, my what if question was like, what what if some segment of the population evolved differently than their neighbors and could do things? They were the next generation of human evolution. They could do things with their mind. What would that do? To the fabric of human, you know, the human civilization, and I started there. So, Diana already sort of answered it, but she has way more than one book. So, what what if question has been your favorite to explore in your fiction? And you know what? Well, this one was not given to me as a question. Sorry, I think no. we can improv after all this time. Um, my what if uh, situation is in. A little background on my story, again, it's like a Lord of the Rings kind of story, so uh, imagine a Lord of the Rings, a Game of Thrones era, and the land is kind of all like villages and city-states and things like that. There's obviously monsters and, and whatever. But my, my thing is, what if we could reunite humanity? And if this happens in the story, that can kind of relate to what happens in our real world. Imagine what we could do as a human race if we all kind of were united in the things that we could do. Uh, like, I, I'm always big into science fiction, but like, uh, going to the planets and, and, and moving out to the solar system. And uh, if we didn't have all this silliness that we are so divisive um, in our own world, imagine what, if, what, what could we do? Imagine how much further we could be. I mean, believe it or not, in 1969, we put a man on the moon. We haven't done it again. Well, in 72 or whatever it was. But we haven't done it yet. Why? Because we have too many petty things we're fighting about on our own planet. And it's getting worse. So in my books, like I said, I try to get you out of our world. But in the same realm, I'm trying to get my young 20-year-old righteous warrior is leading the way to reunite humanity. And if that happens, then what can go on from there? So. I'm not going to give much away, you can buy the books, but that's my what if. What if we could read that humanity? What could we do? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, it's still touching on me how, uh, you know, the same situation looks different depending on your perspective thing. And um, I'm going to talk about Providence Paranormal College. And these, are, these are ten books, and there's two different main characters in each book. So you do get a lot of perspective. Um, in this series, and I do that on purpose because I want to explore the perspective and I want to show that nobody, no one person, not even a pair of people have all the answers. Um, one of the things about um, about my work when when I try to when I try to um, ask what if is what if this character ran into the problem that character ran into? And I can't really do that in a book like Supernatural Vigilante Society, where Valentino is, is the main character, and he's the only perspective you really get. I can do that here because I have 20 people whose perspectives you get to see. So when, um, you know, when I wrote this, I thought, what if some of these students can't figure out what's happening with the, their own resources or with their own perspectives. Maybe they can see what's happening but they have no idea why so they don't know where to go from, from there with the information they have. But the next two characters, maybe one of them does. So, I mean, it also ties in a bit to what Mike was saying about what can we do if we drop all of the differences we have for a minute and put our heads together. So, you know, that's that's a big what if that I that I like to explore. I took I did it with ten books. So, <laughs> so my what ifs are uh, in regards to my trilogy, which I'll show you guys. 
So I'm thinking about this realm where uh, human souls are sorted by these light beings, and it's their job to determine who lives where and who ends up with who and who does everything in life, basically. So when there is a mistake in book one, Luna has to go out to fix it. So the question that I like to think about is, what if that was actually true? Like, I'm not getting theological here. I'm just trying to like think of a fun little plot to play with. So on a very lighthearted note, like I like to think, what if there really was this realm where these beings chose things, and when they messed up, they ha we had to be kind of at their whim. You know, we just had to go with what they said and what they wanted us for us. Would that be a good thing, a bad thing? Would that be complicated? Most likely, I'd say yes. Um, there's just a lot that you can do with that, and then you get to ethical questions like free will and uh, mortality comes into play as well because there is a sort of, not a reincarnation element, I don't like using that term because I don't feel it fully uh, kind of names it correctly, but there are elements where dead isn't always dead. Um, sometimes things come back in pieces through genetic sort of um, materialization and genetic kind of playing with the rules a little bit. So there's a lot of uh, complicated elements that I really enjoy getting to play with and I think um, the time travel sort of element that I brought into book three plays really well into that. So you'll just have to read to find out how that plays out. But it's so fun. So I'm going to ask one last question before I open it up for your questions. And that is, has there ever been um, something that has happened live, like in the news, that you've incorporated directly into, not directly obviously, but that you know in your mind it directly influenced something you were writing about? Well, um, we don't have to look too far in our world to see that there's all different kinds of countries and different governments uh, that way. And um, there's a lot of dictators that have, are still here that have been uh, in the past and everything like that. And in my story, I have a couple of areas where I have evil kings, evil dictators, and things like that. Uh, one of my is Lord Nigel Hammer. He's great. He's like the Sheriff of Nottingham, but he really just twists my main character all the time um, because my main character is so righteous and he's just not. And, um, you know, he builds, he, he takes over a city, puts walls up around us so the people can't leave, and it just reminded me of how, in this, my storyline, they have to, you know, liberate cities. And it was basically Saddam Hussein with the Iraq War, how he had his whole place and we just all came in. So that was kind of one um, area where I took a real world uh, situation and made a wartime um, epic out of the battle and fantasy world. So um, where we had bombs and planes and tanks, you know, my world had some magic and some warriors and archers and, you know, there was a resistance on the inside. So it worked out pretty much like a real world situation when it actually happened. Um, I, I have alternate history. Of course, I write thinking about what happened in the real world. Um, a Change in Crime and its uh, other companion book, Wiser Guys, um, they both draw off of actual historical events. Um, the Jones Act, I was writing about this here, and then after I published it, the Jones Act was in the news again. So I'm like, oh my goodness. So book three in this series is definitely going to delve a little more into the Jones Act, and I planned that before it came back up into the news again. Um, but I'm sure people will read that book and go, oh, she must have been writing this during all of that, and should we abolish the Jones Act? And, you know, that's, they're going to think I was influenced by that. And maybe in the actual writing process, when I did the drafting, it was somewhat, but my original idea wasn't. Um, I think sometimes we write almost intuitively about things that that are affected um, the real world around us, and we don't really consciously think about it. It just sort of happens. Um, in in Wiser Guys, I have the very first chapter. Uh, Bill and Millie, who are magical twins, they they watch their mom faint because she takes a look at the newspaper and it's the stock market crash that she just read. So. Um, they're definitely affected by real current events. Uh, we had we have had market crashes since I wrote that. We have had market crashes prior to when I wrote that. 
how much is me and my creativity and how much is from the world around me, it's hard to tell because we're sort of connected to our environment. I haven't uh, taken a specific political sort of uh, newsworthy element into my work explicitly, but I do comment a lot on the diversity of humans and how different people are and how our backgrounds really shape who we become, kind of for better or worse, oftentimes. And we're not limited to that, but I think a lot of what we begin as kind of starts there. So in the realm of the real world, I guess I see it as different people often clash in different perspectives and cultures. It's a really sad truth of reality, but I think those differences also kind of unite us in our difference, and that brings about potential for understanding and peace in many occasions. So I hope to kind of look into that with my books and bring that element into my writing. All right, so, audience, do you have anything you want to ask us? And it can be, you know, writing craft, it can be world building, that's the panel we used to do together, it can be all kinds of things. Yes. Uh, actually, in response to what you asked about real life witnesses, and this happened to be a real life witness who was from the former Soviet Union uh, counter warfare sector. I met him coincidentally in Fort Setting, and a lot of mine is uh, over the course of three or four weeks, he disposed me a lot of stuff. It was really intriguing to me, and also very scary to be honest with you. Then he disappeared. And my question to you is this is a real person, and I'm writing a book that incorporates kind of that theme, in not specific words, but the theme. Is there, a, is there a, some form of ethical issue that you might see that relates to anything in the country? You well, understand what I'm saying? I, I, ethical meaning you're going to deal with things that are potentially secrets that you heard from somebody and, and you're divulging them to us. <laughs> I think, you, it, you know, all fiction comes from somewhere, right? I mean, and you know, we're, we're drawing on the things that we maybe have some familiarity with. It's just distance it enough that you can talk about it without naming names and, and getting anybody into trouble, right? Um, and I think that that's... I think we should talk about those things. They make the most interesting, believable conflicts, right? Is if we can have that shred of reality there, that's scary. <laughs> right, it's gonna scare you. So I think that's, we get some good stuff out of that. But you just distance it enough that, you know, you're not. Uh, I'm, writing, I'm, I'm writing a series of books and I have a couple of main characters that are pretty consistent, but I'm using a slew of secondary and tertiary characters. A slew of what? Uh, just a whole bunch of extra characters. Do you see a danger in, in having too many characters? Yes. I think that I'm going to let the guy that has a lot of characters in it. Yeah, I basically I have uh, three stories, and I, my fourth book's going to come out next year that's going to wrap up this series. And I have a core group of characters. Um, it starts with seven. So, yeah. and then um, there's a bunch of secondary characters, a lot. Um, because I have dwarves, I have elves, I have uh, an evil race called the Scythians, I have other united armies of humans. Um, but what I usually do is I pick a leader, and, uh, or maybe a second in command of each of these factions. So you may have an army of 2,500 soldiers, but you're only really going to talk about one or two people within that army, because you want to keep your core characters, the the main characters. So it's it's okay, but you just don't want to have too many characters where people will be like, I can't remember what this person was doing, why is he still here or not? So I would just be careful with um, clearly define your main characters and their supporting characters. And then if you're writing multiple books, it's okay to bring secondary characters along. Um, and just just try to figure out how important those secondary characters are. So if they all of a sudden disappear, do you really need them? So think of it that way. Yeah, okay. And then yeah, sometimes your secondary characters have such an interesting story that maybe they shouldn't be secondary characters, right? So it's figuring that piece out. They have to be interesting enough to keep people uh, engaged and be that supporting cast, right? But you don't want them to, to overtake. And if their story is that much more interesting than the main characters, maybe you've got the wrong main character. What I'm afraid of is that because my secondary characters are interesting, that they're going to create subplots 
and you know, and kind of like right now, I mean, th those are called spin-offs. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. Look at look at Marvel comics and all of those characters. <laughs> you can no, have but I mean, a spin-off for the same series. Well, okay, yeah. Right, off. Yes, but you also you need to. I mean, I would say you've got to, you, you have to write your story, and if you get so far off track telling all these other stories, you're never going to have a story. Right. So, what I do often, if I find something's getting so exciting and interesting, is yeah. I'll write a little note and I'll stick it in a file folder and be like, "You're for later. This is not for today," and then I stick back to the story at hand. Um, and that's where, I mean, Mike is a huge outliner. I'll let these guys answer whether they do or not, but I think that's helpful. You don't want to be stuck to an outline so rigidly that you're, you can't, you don't have flexibility, you can't make the story better, but you do want to have a story that has a clear beginning, middle, and end, and a pathway to get there. And so, often these tangents can just, just, you might not get there. <laughs> you could be writing this for 10 years, and so. About that long. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. That, that's okay. But I mean, if you want to finish it, you know, you need a path to get there. So, do you guys have anything to add about that? Well, I have um, these. I, I split them into separate books to have different main characters, so that yeah. you can have more perspectives. And these are for first person. This book has twenty characters in it. They're not all point of view characters, and I wrote it in third person. And it's third person close. So you get perspective of maybe eight of the characters. Um, but the thing is, you need to make sure they're different enough from each other. People will, will have a problem keeping track of who's who. If you have three characters whose names all start with the same letter, for example. That's very basic stuff. But also, when you're writing their dialogue, or when you're writing something where we get an, uh, an idea of how they think, you can't make them too similar. Otherwise, they're really just two different people serving the same exact purpose in the story. So it's important. Sometimes I've, I've had um, had to merge characters. I had I had three a, a trio of, of mafia soldiers in this book that turned into two mafia soldiers because two of them were just so similar. There was no point to having three. So sometimes you might you might combine some characters, and usually they are your secondary characters. Also, if you have something going on where uh, a person goes off and has a secondary character goes off and has their own little adventure, you can write a short story about it. I have short stories in between all of these books. Yeah, that are some of them are characters that were not point of view characters in the any of these books. Um, but it's something that they went off and did. I have a professor, he's a recurring character, and he never gets a point of view. And he is very important to the plot. And he's a professor at this college. I get to write a whole story from his point of view, a short story, that I put in between two of the books when I made this bundle uh, version of these books. So there's a lot you can do. If you really feel like, yeah, you need to know what this guy was doing, when the other people were doing the heist and robbing the bank, uh, I need to know what the what the drive the driver had a misadventure while he was waiting in the car. He he had uh, some prostitutes come up to chat him up or something. This is nothing I've written. This is off the top of my head right now. And it's it's not even a prostitute he'd ever be interested in. In fact, she's the ugliest prostitute he's ever seen in his life, and he wants her to go away because she's drawing and wanted attention to his vehicle. Um, so he has to think of a way to get her to go away. So I can write a whole story about that and not put it in my book. I can put it later well, in the back of my book. Well, you put it in book. I, I could, but if it's not, if it breaks the tension of my heist scene yeah. by interspersing it in my heist scene that's supposed to be really exciting and crucial and I need the readers to remember everything that happens during the heist, I can't do the funny story about the ugly prostitute in the getaway car. I have to do that somewhere else. So I can put that on my website, I can use it as an incentive to get people to sign up for my newsletter, and, or I can put it in an omnibus edition like this, between books two and three. Really? Yeah, so you can always write that stuff, it's just that you don't have to put it in the book, you can put it somewhere else. I apologize if I have some questions, one last one. <laughs> My story is so complex, I, I need to write, I want to write, I did start to write a glossary of terms, is that inappropriate? Oh yeah, fantasy people love glossaries. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. No, you, you can put, and you can put it in the back of your book, you can put it on, on your website, you could post 
little defi- some of the definitions to social media sort of as teasers. It, it helps me, but I think it'll help the reader. It will. It absolutely will. Yeah. yeah it's in terms that no one knows. You need to yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, boy. She likes. Thank you. Um, about these characters, mm-hmm. they're like the same. Mm-hmm. Like the same. Mm-hmm. So philosophy, so like that. Mm-hmm. So philosophy, yeah, they're acceptable. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? Really? Oh, okay, so there we go. Go ahead. Uh, uh, this actually relates to something you said, uh, how, how do you... How do you write villains if they're like inspired by real people? Like, how, how would you? This, 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 is so, this is something I've kind of been, uh, been juggling with the story. I'm, how do you find the balance between making a villain that thinks they're whiteness or just you know, like evil, they're inspired by someone or in, in the news or something? Like that? Villains, villains, are villains are always fun because they're always a little bit crazy and things like that. Um, if, if you're like seeing something um, in the real world that's inspiring for this one, you just embellish on to find some things that makes this person, why is this person evil or eccentric or whatever, and then just expand on it, make it something even more. So, so you don't want it to be that person, but you want to maybe give it the minimal traits and then just expand off the different other kind of qualities. I, th- I think a villain that's only one dimensional isn't very interesting either. I mean, it can't... I, Darth Vader started off all bad, but then we realized that he had a whole backstory that made him a more interesting character and one worthy of redemption, well, sort of. But, you know, we could go there with that. We can understand. So I like to have the villains have um, something that, that the reader can understand why they got to be where they are. If they're just a bad guy, just for the sake of having your hero have to go up against that, that's not very meaningful. I don't, and that's not the real, that's not, it doesn't ring true either. Because the villains in our world today really believe what they're, you know, either they're crazy and they're a sociopath, and that's a different thing, that's a, that's a you know, that, that's whatever, they're broken. But, uh, but the ones that are doing bad, what we call bad things, or just have a different perspective, and are going up against our hero, there's enough depth there to make that an interesting story, right? So, and to challenge your hero to define themselves against that perspective. So, make sure they've got depth, that's what I would say. Anybody else? Uh, one thing that I'll just add to that real quick, um, I've taken a character and actually turned them into a villain. For example, uh, this character was in a leadership position and she got power hungry and it got to her head and then she got jealous and well, let's just say it didn't end too well for her, but um, that's another tactic you could take, is to take uh, a character that, you know, isn't problematic originally, but you start to kind of sew that in over time, and it starts to uh, emanate as a problem. And then by then the reader's already fallen in love with them, so you're like, oh, they're bad now? Okay, great, but it's a great kind of first tension, so. Um, when you take something or someone, uh, and you turn it into a villain, something from the real world, um, and, and I, I took racism um, as a villain in a book. And um, the character I made espouses a lot of beliefs that uh, go along with very garden variety, blatant racism. Um, in order to not have this character look like they're, I'm saying this is this person or a, a particular person, I made sure that all of their ideology was given bits and pieces at a time as people discovered what was going on. And I also kept it fantastical. The bigotry this person has, the racism this person has, is against non-magical people. So he doesn't care if somebody is a different faith. He doesn't care if someone's ancestors came from a different country than he did. What he cares about is, are they magical? If they're not magical, then they're nothing. They're animals. So the racism is coded into the fantasy nature of the work. So nobody can sit there and point their finger at my villain and say, oh, he's based off of this guy, bloody blah, from Susie Whatsit's nation. No, he's not. 
because they, they probably won't even think of that because they'll go, this guy wants to exterminate the nomad. You know, he's not, they're, they're not gonna say this guy is any whatever group or something. So couching it in the fantasy terms, and if, and if you write contemporary or more realistic stuff, you're gonna run into that. Um, because it, it's, you can't, you can't sort of bury it, you can't code it, you can't correlate it, you can't make a parallel that doesn't really exist in the real world. But um, the best thing to do is to look at not the person you're basing it on, but the people around that person. What did they not see? What did they miss? Um, and when you start defining uh, a villain by why why people make excuses for or don't think they're a villain, you can get them further away from any real basis <clears throat> instead of the facts of what they are. It's sort of more like you're going to make a puzzle piece that fits in here and isn't, isn't the actual piece. Someone's in negative space is what they're Anybody else? Question? Yes. I thought it was interesting at first uh, there were some statements about like uh, there isn't necessarily an obligation to tell about the real world, but at the same time, for me, or in particular, the sci-fi and fantasy are, the, are two of the biggest genres to do that, always. Um, and when you mentioned like the Star Trek episode, I started thinking about like DS9's conflict with um, Renasia and Major, and all of these other things, and how every Star Trek episode is sort of a political statement. And then it seemed like it twisted from this beginning obligation that it is just a part of the work. So I was interested if you think there can be any sort of piece of writing that isn't regarding some sort of, not obligation, but necessity to its, its, its real life counterpart. Is there a way to not bring the, the world that we are existing in into I don't know, I haven't really found a way to do that myself. Because even though I, my, I consider my my job to tell you a good story I'm still me and, the, and all the things that have informed my you know my value structure goes into my work and as Diana said you know the do no harm piece I don't want to do harm with my work I don't want to perpetuate something I don't believe in through my writing so I would say my op I don't feel an obligation and, and I say that because I think people have an agenda sometimes and they have an agenda when they read your work they want to see into it oh you have my point of view and you're getting that out through your writing and I don't know that I am you know I'm not doing that on purpose I'm it's my perspective that I'm working through with my writing so that's where the obligation no obligation comes from it's almost like I don't want to feel obligated to other people to tell a perspective that may or may not be mine or be open to their interpretation of it but um, I can't help it every single piece I've ever written has something in it that's, that reflects my value structure so I don't know how you get away from it truly <laughs> yeah. and I think we had one more question um, okay so the biggest challenge I have with writing is okay you write what you know that's easy but what if you write what you don't know on the topic, so you can research, but how do you get an expert to really help you with that topic so it makes sense? You're going into a submarine, you've never been in a submarine before, how do you write it so it actually makes sense? I'm thinking about a Seinfeld episode or something like that. Yeah. Right, yeah. I think you, you need to find people that are in that field and ask them if they would like to be a consultant on the project. And if you get somebody, a um, good example is the person today, Kim Markan, is a NASA scientist and I'm going to be doing a science fiction story with that man over there eventually and I've asked her if she would like to be the consultant because I'm an engineer by day but I'm not an astrophysicist and I would like to make sure that what we're presenting is going to be correct and you want everything to be correct so if you're writing a story about being in a submarine you've never been in a submarine don't fake it because people will know and you, you may get you know pull the wool over the eyes of some people but there's going to be others that will be like you're way off. Good beta readers help with that. I have a beta reader that's a general, and, and he reads my stuff for the for the military piece of it. To so say, but the guys talk to one another like that. Is this what a dogfight really feels like? You know, like because there's even though it's set in space, there's familiarity. So the things that are familiar, you want to bring them authentically. So the research is excellent. Follow up with that is I remember World War Z. I listened to the audio book, so I'm in the military. With that, they got a lot of information, but I don't think somebody listened to it afterwards. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, that's too many acronyms. 
readers. We wouldn't understand each other. So it's kind of a trust. Good beta people. readers help with that. They yes. can pick out things that, that, you know, they say this will be right out of the story, or that just doesn't strike me as real. I don't know if you guys have anything to add about research and authenticity. Um, I think research is a great option for authenticity, but I would say don't let it damper your creative style. Because if you get so bogged down in source text and technicalities, it's going to start to drag on your flow. And that's a huge part of the writing process as well. So like anything, I'd suggest good balance. You know, follow your gut, follow your heart with this stuff. If it, if there's a fact that doesn't quite go with your story, maybe in the realm of sci-fi you can change that because it is sci-fi. So you have some freedom with it. So just don't be afraid to adjust things when you need to. I was going to say, um, I'm not a historian. And I was definitely not alive during 1929. And if you guys think I am, I really need to go get a makeover. Um, <laughs> anyway, I have a friend, Jared, and he is a master's candidate in UConn, and he studies early 20th century history in New England. Perfect! I just happened to meet this guy at a LARP. Yes, I'm a huge geek. Um, anyway, he read this book, and he told me, you can't use a Zippo. So I asked him what I can use, but I had already written it. So write it. Go ahead and just write it anyway. And while you're writing, Make sure that you use that little track changes and your notes and I add them like in feature too. <laughs> for add them in so that, that if you have a question here or there, you can once you get an expert, once you find one, um, you know what you need help with. So if you if you're saying, Oh, I really don't know what it's like to be in a summary, write the scene, let the guys talk. You know, don't write too much of the setting information and leave yourself a note. And that way, when you go maybe down to Connecticut and you go to the Navy base and you ask them if there's anyone who's been in a submarine who's willing to talk to an author, you know what to ask him. And I guess we are out of time. Yeah. So anyway, we'll be at tables. Um, I'm at 318. Mike is... On my table. Somewhere. Just come look for me. Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, where are you? Um, I'm in the 600s, okay. something or other, but I have a big banner also, and it's got like a fairy queen and a fairy king on you it. You can't miss us. Yeah. <laughs> where are you? I'm literally right outside. Okay. I'm right outside the door. You can't miss me. It's like right so there. So we're happy to keep talking about any of this stuff at our table. So thank you guys. Thank you.